Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is playful pinnipeds, sea lions of the Galapagos. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Luis Vinueza. Luis, so glad to see you. Cannot wait to join you in the Galapagos for the next hour. Let's go ahead and dive in. Thank you very much, Sunny. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to present you these uh, funny, charismatic animals that we have in the Galapagos. And that uh, if you come, for sure, you're going to have a chance to interact with them because they are super curious, especially the Galapagos sea lion. And um, it's uh, going to be great to talk about them. They are super fun. They get, as I said before, very close uh, to humans when we swim, when we hike everywhere. And so I'm going to tell you a bit about myself. Um, this is me. And so I've been uh, here in the Galapagos since 1995. I studied biology. And at first, I studied seabirds. Then later, I became part of the Charles Darwin Station. And I sort of focused more on the marine uh, environment. So for my master's and PhD, I studied marine ones. And then I became a professor. Then uh, a few years after, in 2017, I became a naturalist guide. And uh, I love uh, what I do. Uh, my job is fantastic because I can contemplate nature through the eyes of our guests. And so I am super um, excited about that every time I go there. For example, the last time we saw killer whales and bright whales, and we interacted with a lot of sea lions. And so Galapagos is a very unique place because it offers you the opportunity to get close to this uh, unique um, fauna. Also, uh, you know, not only in the water, but also in the land. But today, we're going to focus on these uh, sea lions, which are super cool. All right, so what I'm going to talk today is about the sea lions and the four seals. These are the two species that we have here in the Galapagos Islands. Then I'm going to show you where we have a chance to see them as we navigate on board of our uh, boats. And I'm going to tell you a bit about the adaptations they have to this marine life, uh, because these uh, actually evolved from carnivores. And so they adapted to the marine life with fantastic changes. Then I'm going to talk about sexual dimorphism, you know, this huge difference that are, uh, are between male and females. And then I'm going to talk about reproduction. And so this is particularly interesting because these both species are going to nurse uh, the uh, pups for at least uh, two to three years. And so this is the longest uh, nursing period in any sea lion or four seal. Now I'm going to tell you a bit about how they uh, hunt for their food. Okay, so what are their hunting strategies? I'm going to talk a bit about their behavior and also about their human impact uh, that we have. So let's start. This is just to show you the temperature of the Galapagos through the year. And so if you look at this graph, you can see the months of the year, and then you can see the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. And you can clearly see that we are getting close to the warm season, which is uh, when uh, the ocean is warmer and calmer, and uh, where you can, you know, snorkel for a long time. And then later, you know, in July and August, uh, it gets colder and windier. Uh, colder water means that, you know, you we usually observe more marine life. But because the water is colder, uh, you know, snorkeling, you have to use a wetsuit, which is something that we provide for sure. So just to consider, you know, the time of the year in which you come. Remember March, warmer, calmer waters, August and September, colder uh, waters uh, and also wind. Present. So the boats tend to move more at this time of the year. Now. This is a satellite picture of the world, and uh, you can see at the equator a uh, sort of a greener tone than south or north of the equator. And, and this uh, happens because we have in that area what we call upwelling, which is basically the uprise of cold nutrient rich water. And that makes it possible for marine mammals such as sea lions to live at the equator. Now, what is very interesting is that these are the only two sea lions that live at the equator, 
right, in tropical waters, but as I said before, not so tropical because of this upwelling that uh, makes the water colder and, you know, it makes it possible also for us to have animals that are temperate, like penguins, right, the Galapagos penguins, okay. Now, these two species of sea lions, the poor seal and the Galapagos sea lions only live in Galapagos. It's very rare for them to get out of this place, okay. So this is a map of the world that is showing us just the different species of fur seals and uh, sea lions that we have, okay. Fur seals are in numbers and sea lions are in letters. And so I'm going to talk about all these species, but I just want you to look at D and A. That is the, where the Galapagos are located. And that is where the two species of sea lions live, okay. Now, the ancestor of uh, the sea lion of uh, the Galapagos is the California sea lion, or the leather E, okay? Now, the Galapagos lion separated the species more or less two million years ago, and now they are a different species, okay? The same with the fur seal. The Galapagos fur seal came from South America, from Arthocephalus australis, okay? or the South American fur seal, all right? So that is the origin of these two species that only happen now in the Galapagos Islands. And this is a map of the Galapagos where you can see the distribution of these two species with red circles representing the Galapagos sea lion and green triangles representing the fur seals, okay? And I'm gonna show you pictures very soon. But as you can see, the Galapagos sea lion have a wider distribution uh, that is more prominent in the southern and central islands, while the fur seals are more prevalent in the western part, the archipelago, where they are closest to the colder waters that we have, right? So on the west is also where we have the highest concentrations of Galapagos penguins and a lot of marine mammals because these waters are more productive. So there are differences in their distribution. But in some parts of the archipelago, they overlap their distribution. Okay, this is the Nemo, our sailing boat, where you will be able to explore the islands. And this is the Petrel, our other uh, catamaran that we also use uh, to go around the archipelago. Okay, and you know, as I said before, we are going to provide you with the right gear for you to be able to snorkel with sea lions or also see them from the shoreline because we will do dinghy rides to observe them, as I will show you. And uh, so, you know, uh, uh, sea lions are a uh, type of marine mammals as well as the poor seals that are called pinnipeds. And so this is because they have extended uh, flippers uh, that they use for swimming, okay? And these animals, uh, you know, spend the majority of their time in the ocean but they also go to the land to rest and to give birth and to feed the pups, okay? Sea lions at some point uh, were related to carnivores, and so that's why they have sharp teeth similar to uh, carnivores, and they uh, shake basically their head violently to be able to tear fish apart, okay? And their diet goes from you know, small uh, anchovies and sardines all the way to tuna and sharks when sharks are little, right? So they have a specific adaptations for a marine life, okay? So they have a streamlined body shape that decreases drag underwater, okay? And they have their four flippers, which are what they use to prepare themselves in the water, while the rear flippers are used for steering, okay? Now, a lot of people confuse sea lions with seals, and I just want to make this um, distinction very clear. So when you come to the Galapagos, you call them sea lions or poor seals, which are not true seals. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. All right, so this is the difference between seal and sea lions, okay? So just to start with the seals, we know that they are smaller in size in general. They have ear holes, but they don't have external ear flaps. And that's a very important distinction. Their frog flippers are tiny, okay, and they are webbed and they have claws, okay. And the rare flippers is what they use to propel themselves in the water, 
by moving their pelvis. And so they pro propel themselves like fish. Okay. Now, sea lions are more noisy. They will bark. Okay. They have uh, external ear flaps. They have front flippers that are elongated. And that's what they use to swim in the water. And the rear flippers can rotate under their body. And they can use these features to walk um, in the land, right? And so no problem for them to climb up on cliffs or rocks or even on top of boats, which they love to. This is now the distribution of the Galapagos sea lion that overlaps with the sites that we visit. And so you can see that the larger circles is where we have the largest populations. Okay, so if you look on the map to the southeast, you are going to see the island of San Cristobal. Okay, this is the one that is closest to the mainland. And there we have the highest concentration of sea lions that just happened in town. This is the town where I am speaking at present. So this is the place where we have the largest sea lion population that interacts a lot with humans. But as you can see, in many parts of the archipelago, we are going to have a chance to see them and to swim with them, which is very cool. And so this is a typical uh, male sea lion, OK? And uh, as you know, uh, they, are, uh, they live on the land, but they have to live very close to the water, OK? Because this is a tropical place and they need to thermoregulate. So they need, live very close to the shoreline uh, when they come to the land. They are philopatric. That means that they come back to the same rockeries where they were born, especially the females, because males move around trying to defend territories from other males, okay? Now the Galapagos sea lion is the smallest sea lion of the world as well, because they live in a tropical location. Just to give you a, a comparison, you know, the California sea lion can reach up to seven or even 800 pounds, where the Galapagos sea lion only reach up to 500 pounds. So they became smaller than their ancestors when they came to the Galapagos, because the waters in the Galapagos are not as productive. Okay, so these males, as I said before, can reach up to seven feet and 500 pounds of size. And males tend to be larger than females, because uh, they have a polygenous system in which males are going to defend territories uh, where females are present, okay? And so the larger they are, you know, the better success they have at holding territories and staying there, uh, holding them, okay? This is another male, and you can see that they have a bump in their head. And this is because there they have a sagittal bone where they anchor the muscles for the fight. And so these crests become more prominent as they age, and they might live up to 20 to 25 years. Okay. Um, as I said before, they have a polygenous mating system, and they need close uh, access to water, as I said before. Uh, the females are going to be, again, available uh, or in heat, you know, four weeks after giving birth. And that's where uh, reproduction will happen. And reproduction happens in the water. But unlike uh, other sea lions, uh, apparently the females are the ones that choose whether or not they want to mate with the male. And another very uh, interesting feature is that smaller males might sneak into the territory of these larger males when they are not looking. And so we know, uh, due to genetic studies, that 50% of the pups come from these sneaky males that go uh, in and copulate with females when the big male is not looking. And I think that that's really funny. All right, so this is just a small video of a, a big male patrolling the colony very close to the shoreline. <laughs> That's the male, you can see it's big, up to 500 pounds. And I was not careful enough. And so this is the animal we have to look after when we snorkel because they can be very territorial. 
you see it came very close to me and uh, tried to, to bite me okay so that was a very good lesson that was learned of course these are the females all right they, they are much smaller they don't have that sagittal bone that i told you on the crest um the females can reach up to five feet and they weigh up to 200 pounds okay so less than half of the males okay and they have very high uh, fidelity to the sites where they were born much more than the males as i said before and so the ones that bring the genetic variability to the colony are actually the males okay and they like to rest uh, very close to the shoreline as i said before but also they like to have access to shade and that's something that they find under trees right the trees are important very close to the shoreline to provide them with shade during the hot hours of the day right so as i said before they like to get together in big groups and uh, these groups are usually formed by you know um, females then um, pups and then subadults females especially not big males because as i said before there will be a big male patrol in the shoreline okay big males usually gather in bachelor's territories when they are not fighting and what's interesting is that the males are going to hold these territories for up to three weeks in which they don't go for any food okay so that's important to consider that's why they can only hold these territories for a limited period of time This is just another picture of them or a small video of them interrupting. And so as I said before, they are very vocal. This is in Santa Fe Island. And they like to get together. And that way they can keep warm. And obviously the uh, mothers go to the shoreline to give birth because in that way, you know, uh, they avoid the predation by sharks or killer whales, okay? And so usually also the pups stay very close to the shoreline, especially when they are little because they don't have enough strength to escape predators. However, you know, uh, mortality happens every now and then. And so this is something that we were able to witness with our guests the other day a sea lion being born okay and they have 11 months of gestation and this involves two months or three months where they delay the implantation of the egg okay so just look at this it's very fast It's alive. So that was a very unique experience that happened just a couple of weeks ago on Santa Fe Island. That's the first time I was able to witness something like that, the whole process. And our guests were also able to witness that. So that was amazing. So as I said before, sea lions are going to nurse their babies for up to three years. And this is because the Galapagos uh, has a very unpredictable environment. 
And sometimes we have bad years that uh, have uh, very warm waters. And so mothers are gonna take a long time feeding at sea. When the baby is born, when the pup is born, the mother is gonna spend the first five to seven days with it, uh, smelling it, uh, recognizing the vocalization, because that's very important, because they are only gonna nurse their own babies, okay? They don't nurse any other babies, okay? And uh, usually the females might go for a few hours, up to four days uh, for uh, hunting for food at sea. And so at that period of time, the pups, uh, you know, stay alone and they usually play together in big groups, okay? And as I said before, they take a very long time uh, together with their mothers, up to three years. So that's uh, important to uh, recognize, All right? So now the transition to uh, independence uh, takes three days, but that doesn't mean that they don't try to find their own food. So, you know, basically when they are little, they will start playing, trying to, uh, you know, start capturing little fish that are very close to the shoreline, okay? But they don't go very deep, they don't go very far, until they grow older. This is another video just showing you how playful they are because they have a lot of time to, you know, play around while mom is hunting for food. So this is Española Island. This is one of our snorkeling mountains. So they are very playful, very playful, right? Uh, sea lions also hunt in, in different parts of the ocean. Uh, some of them are pelagic foragers. That means that they go to water that is deeper than 600 feet. Some of them are benthic foragers and they are different. I'm gonna show you why, right? So they have different strategies. Some of them are gonna go at night and some of them are gonna go as deep as 1,500 feet. That's amazing considering that they only hold their breath for up to seven minutes, right? So they are fast, they are really fast. Okay, so when they are hunting, for example, females might go 60 miles, okay, away, but you know, small sea lions, less than six miles, less than six to 10 miles, okay? Now, this is another video that I took last week of uh, baby sea lions, you know, playing. Just chasing our thing. So that was super cool, and uh, you know, this is some some of the things that you can see uh, because these guys have a lot of time to play around. But now, you know, as I said before, they also go underwater, and so uh, in order to do this, they have a sharp vision, and they also have a spher a spherical or slightly elliptical lenses that provide them sufficiently a refractive power underwater. So that means that they can see objects very well underwater, okay? They also have a larger pupil and have many rolls in the retina that makes it very sensitive to light, okay? They also have a protein that is called myoglobin that has high affinity for oxygen, okay? And I'm gonna talk more about that later. But when they go down, they basically slower their heart rate while diving you know, from about 95 uh, beats per minute to less than 20 beats per minute, okay? Sea lions also have higher blood volume, and that's important uh, in the sense of this uh, protein that binds more oxygen, so that allows them to be underwater, right? 
because they have this extra oxygen capacity to store, okay? And so when they, they are diving, the blood is basically shunned away from tissues uh, that don't need the blood that much, you know, except for the brain and the heart, obviously, okay? And as I said before, they have a high concentration of this protein that has high affinity for oxygen called myoglobin. Okay, that makes it possible for them to hold their breath um, and to go that deep, okay? And so the concentration of this protein is 10 times higher than what happens in humans, all right? So one thing that is very cool is that Galapagos uh, sea lions are very deep divers, okay? They go down to 900 feet, considering that their closest relatives, the uh, California sea lions, only go half of that, right? So it's amazing they can go down to uh, sometimes 1,500 feet. Okay, that's amazing. But on average, you know, females uh, go down to 500 feet and uh, small sea lions uh, less than that. You know, at 12 months of age, they go down to 1,200 feet more or less. And that is when they start hunting for more fish. And so with time, you know, and after three years, they become expert hunters. And this is a picture that show you these whiskers, okay? These whiskers are very important for these animals in terms of finding food underwater because these are very sensitive to the movement of fish. And so these are basically like our fingers. They can feel very well with this and sense, uh, as I said before, the shape of the fish, uh, the change in direction of the movement of the fish and so on. So this is very useful for a uh, benthic and pelagic foragers, but mostly for pelagic foragers because these whiskers tend to be larger in these guys that are gonna go down uh, for that deep. And so you can see the pelagic foragers, which is on the right, have longer whiskers that can measure up to a foot, okay? That's amazing that in the same species, you can have these morphological differences that allow them to go shallower or deeper. And what's cool is that if they work together because they have these vocalizations and they can hear, hear very well, they can work in groups. And this is something that scientists recently documented because tuna is very fast. They outrun the sea lions in terms of the speed. But if they work together, they can ambush them and hunt them. And it's a very coordinated sort of process. You can see in this graph, you know that a documents chronologically how they move together as a group to corner the tuna or other type of fish on the shoreline. And this is something that we see more and more. So it's something that they learn, right? And as I told you, they are very cool to see. They are adorable. So these are very common. And that's what is very cool about the district. Now, these are the population trends, and I can tell you, unfortunately, that there has been a drastic reduction, more than 50% of the population. Census has started around 1978, and we estimated more or less 30 to 40,000 of them. These days, less than 20,000, you know, between 13,000 and 400 and 18,000 and 400. This was a paper that was published in 2023. I just show you the dramatic reductions that happen because of uh, what I'm gonna talk later because this effect also affects the other sea lion is uh, El Nino and climate change, all right? So now I'm gonna switch to the other uh, Galapagos sea lion, the Galapagos poor seal. And this is uh, where, you know, we are gonna see them during the trip. They are much shyer than the Galapagos sea lion, okay, uh, definitely. And so let's just look at them. Uh, they are uh, more abundant in the western part of the archipelago. Um, and so here, the largest colony, I'm not showing this uh, in the map here to you, is on the western part of Fernandina and also in Punta Vicente Roca in Isabela, the island that has the shape of a seahorse. And so just in the mouth is where we usually observe them. Okay. So this is the Galapagos poor seal. And as I said before, the ancestor came from the South American poor seal from uh, Chile and Peru. And that's where uh, they originated. 
but now this is a different species and this is the smallest of all the pinnipeds in the world the smallest of the smallest and so you can see that they have larger eyes they have a blunter face more like the face of a wolf okay and they have two layers of fur that are super thick so unlike the galapagos sea lions these guys like to be more uh, close to uh, areas where they can get more shade okay and one thing that affected them is uh, hunting by sealers right they were almost hunted to extinction uh, and around 1906 the california academy of sciences came to galapagos and only found three in the whole archipelago okay but now uh, the numbers are back but also they have suffered a dramatic reduction uh, since the 1970s, as I'm gonna show you. So they are smaller in size. They have big eyes because they hunt at night, okay? And they hunt for fish that migrate to the surface of the water, especially in periods where the moon is not full, okay? That's where they hunt their, their food. This is another male, all right? And as I said before, they are much larger than the other species a much smaller than the other species sorry um okay so these guys uh, can uh, reach uh, you know no more than uh, 250 pounds so it's almost half the size of the galapagos sea lion and they also defend territories but not as long as the galapagos sea lions because they can alternate you know a territoriality with a feeding at night and so they might leave the colony and then still you know when they come back keep holding the same territory okay this is a female is uh, much smaller than the other one okay they can reach uh you know up to 88 pounds okay much smaller uh, because it's the same system and uh, also it's very important the recognition between the pup and the mother uh, and this is something that they do when the pup is born this is a pup more or less uh, four months of age so you can see they are different you know big guys uh, shorter and more bended ear flaps smaller body size and this is another pup as you can see This is so you can see how thick is the food compared to the other sea lion. This is some territorial behavior. This was also in Santiago, a place that we call Puerto Vegas. And this is one underwater that I just filmed the other day. So as I said before, they are shyer than the other sea lions, all right? So it's hard to see them. But in this video, it's very cool that, you know, you can see them both. This is the Galapagos sea lion coming at the rest of okay. So this one was particularly curious. Now, these are the population trends. You know, in 1978, there were more or less 30,000 of them. But because of El Nino events, uh, the same reasons, uh, nowadays the population may be up to anywhere between 8,000 and 12,000 individuals. Much better than uh, when they were almost hunted to extinction. Okay. And so, as I was saying, what is the main driver of the decline is El Nino events and climate change, because during El Nino events, the water gets really warm and there is no wind stirring up the water masses. So as a result of that, the primary productivity basically shoots down. And so in the picture that corresponds to May 10, 1998, you can see a red, you know, patch that is huge, that is overlapping the Galapagos Islands. You know, that's warm temperature. And in the lower panel, you can see how uniform becomes the Galapagos in terms of the concentration of plankton. No productivity during El Nino, or very little. So there is no food, there is no fish 
So mortality rates are very high on pups and big males, okay? But, you know, when we have the opposite, stronger winds, the species might recover. And so this is a picture, satellite picture of the conditions of the ocean yesterday. And we are now in an El Nino event. And so you can see that the water at this point is more or less three degrees to four degrees Celsius above the average. But we know that this El Nino event, uh, the one that we are having now is fading away. Now, another place where you are gonna be able to interact with sea lions is as I said before, in towns, because they get very close to humans. So some of these are gonna eat the discards of fish, and this is something you are gonna be able to see during the trip. And they love flat surfaces, so they come very close to humans. But there are some issues with that. Like this big male sea lion that went on top of a boat. Well, the boat owners don't like that for obvious reasons but they love it you know so they get very close to humans and that's a one of our dinghies and that's another dinghy and so they love flat surfaces but because they are very curious they also get in trouble um, and so uh, it's uh, not frequent but sometimes we see uh, animals that are entangled with fishing nets and when they are small enough we act, but if not, then we call the national park and they come and uh, release them because this is something that we do here in Galapagos. When we see something that is human related, uh, we try to do the best to uh, help the condition of that animal. And so just uh, to close uh, my talk today, you know, Galapagos sea lions and poor seals are unique. As I said before, they are the only ones that live at the equator. You are going to have the chance to swim with them, observe them uh, from the boats, uh, from uh, the dinghies, and during our hikes. Poor seals are more restricted and shy, but uh, you know we will see a few here and there. And El Nino and climate change and human impacts affect the population of sea lions and poor seals. And with that, I want to end this. Luis, and, thank you. Uh, open it. So yes, go ahead. I, I jumped the gun. I thought you were done. <laughs> I thank you so much for presenting. And we have lots of questions, if that's what you were going to say. Yes, please go for it. <laughs> um, we do have wonderful questions already, but I just want to remind everybody that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Mm -hmm. um, just want to start out by saying there's some folks who are with us today who've, who've been with you, who are about to leave for the Galapagos, and there's lots of excitement on both fronts. So That's I wanna let you know that. Um, can you, the, so the video of the, the mom giving birth was amazing. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, whether it's usually one pup, do they ever have twins? Um, anything more about that situation That's that you wanna share? That's a very good question. And so the reason why they don't have a baby every year is because they have this very long nursing period of up to three years. And so it's very unusual. And if that happens, usually the oldest one is going to bully the little one and the little one might die of starvation. It can only happen when we have very productive years. And so you will say that sea lions are going to have a pup every two to three years, not every year. Hmm. And, and as I said for the reason, the weather is very predictable. So, you know, uh, California sea lions only nurse their babies for one year. In Galapagos, up to three years. Hmm. Okay. Um, there were lots of questions related to proximity to um, the sea lions. Um, is it dangerous to swim with them? Do you think that it was okay it, to be so so close to the mama when she was giving birth? Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between humans and sea lions and what you feel is safe and acceptable? It's a very good question. And so, you know, we have a minimum limit of six feet from the animals. And so that's something that we respect in the land and also underwater. But underwater, we cannot control the animals. And so they come usually close to us. What we don't allow for our guests to do is to reach for them. So sea lions are gonna play around and swim around you and they want you to do the same, but we don't touch them. 
Now, this male sea lion uh, is usually present in the places where we snorkel, but the guides, the expedition leaders, always have a close eye and also our dinghy drivers uh, about these animals. And so when we hear them, basically we get off the shoreline because this is what they are telling us, get off my territory. And because they mate in the water very close to the shoreline, that's the area that we want to get away. And so there are some specific sites where these interactions might happen more often than others, and we know. And so we are prepared to, to deal with it. But, you know, saying this, I, can, I have to recognize that sometimes these guys are going to bite it. Never in uh, my experience. But I know that they can happen. And do the sea lions and fur seals get along? Do you ever see them interacting or playing? Like when uh, you saw this video, you know, I showed both of them. The last video I showed, both of them coincided in the water. And they might coincide in uh, some places, but they don't um, hunt for the same prey. For example, fur seals are nocturnal. And they mostly eat a, eat a nocturnal type of fish that comes close to the surface. While mm -hmm. sea lions go for a variety of fish that goes from sardines, to anchovies, to sharks, to tuna. So they have a more diverse diet. Mm -hmm. Now, sea, sea poor seals, for example, prefer cliffs and places where they can gauge shape not sandy beaches. And sea lions love sandy beaches and flat surfaces where humans are, and so fur seals don't like that. And so I would say that they don't overlap uh, necessarily in the land, and they have a different diet. Okay. And can you just clarify, sometimes it's hard to completely understand, the fur seal is a sea lion, not a seal. Is that yeah. correct? Okay. That's correct. But that's how they have been called, you know, for a many, 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 a long time, mm. right? And so, but they are not true seals. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is all the questions we have today. Lots and lots of comments, as I mentioned, of people who are reliving the experience that they had um, in the Galapagos, myself included. I will say that swimming um, snorkeling with the sea lions was just one of the highlights of my my travels ever anywhere. anywhere. <laughs> it was so so fascinating to see those big eyes just kind of circling underwater and doing their gymnastics and um, just total highlight. So thank you for bringing that back into my awareness. Um, I'll turn it back to you if you have any closing comments. Uh, well, no, it's just these animals are super cool, you know, it's like ma the marine ones are my favorite, but I have to say that these guys always show, you know, steal the show on every trip. And so what's great is that we can always uh, see them and um, it's, it's fantastic. So I, you know, encourage people to come and, and see them. Hmm. Well, thank you again for taking time to present to us today, Luis, and thank you to everyone else who tuned in and who offered such wonderful questions. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.